Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the NBA front office show. Today, we're going to continue our preview slash review series, breaking down the Atlanta Hawks and the Dallas Mavericks, the move that moves that they've made during the offseason, what we think it's going to mean for them during the season. We're going to answer a bunch of questions as we go along. But first and foremost, Keith Smith and I, obviously, we are on the same page because we both <laughs> decided to wear blue shirts for today's show. I think that's a good omen, Keith. Blue polo That's shirts right. too, because I almost went with a blue T-shirt, but but I threw on the polo. I, I I wanted to look good for you today. I felt I was a little sloppy last time, so I, I wanted to look good for you. Well, today. no, no kidding. Blue was always my first date shirt. In fact, I wore a blue shirt my first date with my with my wife, so I always felt like a blue shirt had to be in some way a lucky color or something like that. Uh, so I think that that means this is going to be an absolutely great show today. Well, it was going to be anyway, but <laughs> it certainly doesn't hurt at all. By the way, we do need to mention, speaking of, of things that are going well right now, we are, as of this moment, it's going to be different by the time we finish this show, but we're 150 subscribers away from hitting our 10,000 marks. So thank you to everybody who has subscribed to this show. We certainly appreciate it. If you haven't done so yet, make sure you do subscribe and turn on those notifications as well. Uh, Keith, for no other reason than I've got this graphic up already, why don't we kick things off <laughs> with the Atlanta Hawks. Let's break down what they did during this past off season, what it's going to mean for them during the okay. season and, uh, and everything else in between. Perfect. So what we'll do guys is if you watch the other video where we did this for the Chicago Bulls and Portland Trailblazers, we're going to go through who they added, who they lost, who they retained, if there were other changes and transactions that happened with the franchise. And we're going to ask a whole bunch of questions to each other and, and get into it. So starting out with the Atlanta Hawks players added relatively quiet off season, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. They added in um, uh, Sharif Cooper on a two way contract. Gorgie Jang came in, uh, Jalen Johnson was drafted, and then DeLon Wright. Uh, point guard picked up via trade where they sent uh, two guys who are gone now. Chris Dunn and Bruno Fernando went to the Boston Celtics. Kristen Thompson to the Sacramento Kings, and the Hawks get DeLon Wright. So flipping over to the guys that they lost, I already mentioned, Dunn and Fernando. Brandon Goodwin remains unsigned. Nathan Knight signed a two-way with the Minnesota to Timberwolves. Uh, so he, in effect, is replaced by Sharif Cooper. And then Tony Snell signed a one-year minimum contract with the Portland Trailblazers. So five guys out, four guys in. And then they did pretty good work of retaining some of their own free agents. Um, we won't run through all the names that they retained here because you can read them and see them yourself. Uh, but the guys they re-signed, John Collins was re-signed. That was the big one, obviously. That was the major re-signing. But uh, Solomon Hill, a key role player for them, especially when they had injuries to guys at the forward line like DeAndre Hunter. Uh, then uh, Lou Williams was re-signed. A little bit of backcourt depth there, another score. And then Skylar Mays was brought back on on another two-way contract so hawks roster pretty well finished they've got one open spot if they wave their camp invite guys and in that so that might be something they carry in season and see where it goes and then other changes nate mcmillan was given the permanent head coaching job they removed the interim tag from him after he took over midway through last year and then they signed clint capella to an extension two-year extension that'll kick in a, a couple years from now adds two years on his deal and then trey young clearly the big one uh signed him to the full max if he meets the qualifier which for him would likely be making all nba again he'll get that 30 percent max he'll skip a tier uh just like luka Doncic, it'll be five years about 207 million player option on the fifth year uh if not uh he'll be at about five years 170 ish million or so so uh pretty productive season for the hawks off season for the hawks despite the fact that they didn't do a whole lot as far as roster change out you know, I think that we do need to mention as well, like every time we talk about Luka Doncic and Trey Young, right? They're, they're just forever linked because of that draft night trade. We have to mention that we did not plan this. This was hitting a random button and it spit <laughs> out from the West, the Mavs, and from the East, the Hawks. Just fate has put these two players together. But, uh, but look, Trey Young has been phenomenal. He's been everything the Hawks hoped he would be i do wonder what's going to happen with the new rules how much does that change his game in terms of foul drawing and all of that kind of stuff i think that's fair to talk about but uh but overall when mm -hmm. you look at the hawks roster they didn't do a lot but you also have to give them credit for not messing it up 
right? There's teams right yeah. now who push all their chips in and go land some veteran player that they think is going to make a difference and they really don't. And then next thing you know, they wind up just spinning their wheels. I think the Hawks right now are banking on just organic growth across the board from a number of their players, their younger guys, and I still think they've got flexibility with their wings. So I like what the Hawks did, even though we can look at it and we say, okay, they didn't do that much. Yeah, but they also didn't trip over their own two feet, which I know sounds simple, yeah. but sometimes it's it's not really. <laughs> No, and the reality is the Hawks could have gotten a little cheap mm -hmm. this offseason. They could have said, eh, we spent a lot of money last year on Bogdanovich and Gallinari and uh, so on and so forth. And maybe we can let John Collins go and not go to the five years, essentially 25 million or so that he got. But they didn't do that. They 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 stayed the course. They they brought back their major guys and Collins and Lou Williams, even brought back Solomon Hill, who was you know, he's not a great player, but he's a really good depth piece for them. Uh, they then of the return players retained, uh, they're going to get back to Andre Hunter from injury. He was out yes. for a lot of the second half of the year. I don't remember. I don't think he returned in the playoffs at all. If, if, if that is that maybe I'm off on that, I'll check, uh, I'll check that to make sure. Um, but yeah, he, he's now, or I guess he played early in the playoffs, did not return, um, in the end yeah. uh, for them. So that that's, um, you know, that's kind of almost like an addition in a way uh, for this team and where they're going. So I, I think an important offseason, I think they more or less got it right. Uh, what they, they've done now is they've locked into barring a salary dump or two. They're going to be a tax team uh, next year, not this year. The, this year, they're still clear of it by about three and a half million. Uh, I would not expect them to make any kind of major salary addition trade. Um, but but they'll be a tax team next year, most likely. Um, there's uh, Young's new contract kicks in. They've got Collins on his his new deal. You've got Capella for another year before his extension kicks in. Bogdanovich for 18 million. They could get out of it if they waive Gallo, but I think he's been too important to them to just move on from him. Um, this team does scream to me, maybe they've got a couple guys too many almost. And now that's not a bad place to be, especially injury wise, but that could be a position where maybe we could see a consolidation trade down the line, especially on the wing where you've got Hunter and Herter and, mm -hmm. um, uh, reddish uh, all there all kind of overlapping quite a bit of positionally as well as Bogdanovich and to some extent Gallinari although he's more of a backup four so so that's uh you know where where they're at as far as spending power left they've still got five and a half million of their non-taxpayer mid-level to use so that'll be helpful if they you know, want to go after somebody in buyout season they've got the full biannual exception they're probably not going to use that uh but yeah it's it's a very interesting team so i guess that takes me to the next or uh, next part of this first real question who do you think starts for this team um let, let's not we're not it's opening night but who do you think their main starting five will be well, let's assume DeAndre Hunter is healthy. Um, torn meniscus was the injury that he was dealing with. So we'll have to see exactly where he's at in terms of, of uh, next season once he's, he's ready to go there. But, uh, but if DeAndre Hunter is indeed good to go and he's, and he's healthy and ready to, to move forward there, then I think you do Trey Young, Bogdanovich, and then you go DeAndre Hunter at the three, John Collins and Clint Capella. I think that's just a yep. really long, versatile lineup. You've got scoring punch. You've got, I, I really like that starting five. I like DeAndre Hunter a lot, by the way. I hope that he is healthy and good to go. He dealt with knee soreness during the season, missed a bunch of the season, then tore his meniscus in the playoffs. So fingers crossed, hopefully he'll be uh, ready to go for uh, the start of the regular season. But that's how I see things for Hunter and the in the Yeah, and I, yeah you and I are on the same page uh, with that one. The only... The other option maybe is Kevin Herter. Mm -hmm. um, he started quite a bit. Maybe if Cam Reddish was amazing, he could force his way in there. But, but I'm with you. I think uh, that's where it goes. And then um, so we don't need to spend any more time on that. Then it gets interesting with the bench uh, a little bit because I think this is where it's big for them that John Collins showed he could play small ball five. Last year, he did that quite a bit throughout the season and then quite a bit more in the postseason. Um, and that's big because Onyeka Kongwu is going to be out for uh, at least the start of the season. Um, he's not going to be back um, for them right away. That's why it was important that they added Gorgie Chang, a uh, good uh, 
uh, depth big there behind Clint Capella. Um, he also gives you a little bit of a different look from Capella because he can step out mm-hmm. uh, behind the three-point line. But I think their main bench guys, Gallo, Herter, Reddish, uh, then let's see what they go with. DeLon Wright or Lou Williams, who gets those minutes on the backup uh, point guard line. And my guess is it might be DeLon Wright is a little bit more of a traditional kind of guy. And the team already has plenty of scoring. And then Williams is more of a, all right, we need a spark tonight. Let's throw him in there for 15 minutes and mm-hmm. you know, let him kind of do his thing. Um, that doesn't leave a lot of time for for their first round pick, Jalen Johnson. Um, we can get into him right now real quick. I, I thought he looked really good in summer league. He wasn't a player I was super familiar with from his time at Duke, but you know, long, quick, bouncy forward, um, really rebounded the ball pretty well, uh, scored and shot well, uh, both inside. And he shot over 40% in the summer league uh, from behind the arc, uh, blocked a few shots now I'm out there as well. So uh, I'm excited for him. I think he's going to be a pretty good player. Um, eventually, I just don't know how he cracks this rotation anytime within the next uh, probably two seasons. Yeah, agreed. And that's, uh, you know, unless there's a trade, which, like we said, there there could be um, just an update. The most recent update I could find on DeAndre Hunter is that they think he should be available for the start of training camp, but it's still kind of up in the air whether he'll be ready for the start of the season. I think you're right. If he is indeed not ready to go, then Kevin Herter slides into that starting lineup. But I, I really love how many wins this team has because everybody yeah. in the NBA wants wings so you know yeah. if and when they decide okay we're going to trade one of these guys they're going to get top dollar they're going to potentially have another big move that could propel them forward where you can say okay they kind of stood pat during the offseason re-signed their own guys and I thought they did a nice job re-signing their guys um I think there's potential out there for this team to make a move that could really you know, take them to the next level with all of their wing depth. But I do agree, you know, I like their second unit. I think that uh, that they've got pieces that can certainly light it up from uh, from behind the arc. You look at Danilo Gallinari, he's a guy that if he can stay healthy, can come in and score. So I really like this Hawks team. I think they're clearly in, I don't want to say the top tier of the Eastern Conference, but I think they're in the second tier of the East right now. This is a good team and there's a lot of upside here still. Yeah, I don't have them on the Milwaukee, no. Brooklyn level, but I do think, yeah, they're they're right in that next group, I, I, and they might be at the top of that next group. Let's see what happens with Philly, right? We're, we're still waiting to see uh, what happens with the Ben Simmons trade. We gave a little update on our last show that we just did uh, there on that one. I know peop, so, some people are tired of it, but it's news, so we're going to keep talking about it until, <laughs> until something happens there. Um, so, all right, so let's move that into their biggest strength um i'll I'll go first on this one for me it's a tie between their offense this is one of the best offenses in the league uh trey young john collins they've got all sorts of other guys who can score guys like bogdanovich and galinari you can score off the dribble and do all sorts of stuff uh they're uh, good shooters uh good good inside finishers and collins and capella and those kind of things and then my second because it's right on tied with it is just the overall depth i I think this is one of the deeper teams in the entire league Keith, not only are we wearing the same shirt but you had almost word (laughs) for word my strengths for the for this team the offense and their depth particularly their wing depth uh i really like for this team and uh and so yeah i'll agree with that i guess i'll throw in just to have something different trey young is on their roster which i mean that's and that's something that nobody else in the nba can say he is a yeah. tremendous, tremendous talent that can win you games, uh, can shoot you into games. He can shoot you out of games too at times, but this is an incredible player. I am interested to see how he adjusts to the rule changes, how those rule changes are enforced, because some of them felt like they were specifically targeted at him or players like him. So we'll see how that goes, but he's an extremely talented player, and I think he can indeed adjust. Yeah, I completely agree. I think he's going to be fine. I think he'll he'll figure it out. And, you know, people have thrown out even James Harden. Is he going to struggle? Well, they've changed rules like three different times, and James yeah. Harden is always the same guy. I think Trey Young is built out of that same mold where he'll, he'll just figure it out. And in any time, you know, that this guy is a threat from anywhere inside the half-court line to pull up and shoot, mm-hmm. you're – 
you know, and may, maybe that expands, <laughs> maybe that becomes, you know, just behind the line, he starts pulling up and <laughs> those kind of things. So we'll, we'll see. Um, I can't imagine that would go. Uh, his his well, development I mean, as a player is he just starts shooting from the other side right? of the, of half court now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, you outlet it to him at free throw line extended and he lets it fly. I mean, if it goes in enough, then it's a good shot, I guess. Uh, Biggest weaknesses. Well, what do you see as their biggest weakness going into the season? You know, I I would say lack of experience, but I think they got some decent experience in the playoffs this this last season. Uh, It could be a weakness for them. But other than that, you know, when I look at this team top to bottom, I don't see a lot of weaknesses. I think defensively, maybe you've got some question marks here. Um, But other than that, I think this is a really well-rounded roster. I think think Atlanta has done a really nice job putting this team together. And so I don't look at this team and say, oh, clearly this is the glaring weakness. This is going to be their Achilles heel. They have to fix this. I think this team's really, really good. Yeah, no, I'm with you. I I would have said front court depth without a Kongwu, but they they, uh, rectified that by Mm -hmm. signing Gorgie Jang. And that's fine. You know, Jang for, what, 15, 20 minutes a night behind Capella in the regular season? No, no problem there. That's fine. Uh, you may maybe even only 15 because you probably got five, 10 minutes a night of John Collins at the five, two mm-hmm. with Gallo on the floor. Uh, backup point guard behind Trey Young has been a problem for a long time, uh, really for each of his first uh, four seasons or I guess three seasons in Atlanta. But they went and got DeLon Wright. He's not great, but DeLon Wright is perfectly fine as a backup point guard. Um, I think he'll uh, do well there with, with this team. He also gives him a little bit of a different look because he's bigger. He's more of a pass first kind of guy versus necessarily being a scorer, uh, which is Lou Williams. So, yeah, I struggle to find. It's funny because I don't want to make it out like a struggle to find any weaknesses. This team's going to win <laughs> no, 75 right. Yeah, games. exactly. It's not that. It's, I guess probably their biggest weakness is just defensive consistency. Mm-hmm. And that, that that's still, there's not, nobody screams to me. That's the guy I'm putting on a, yes. the other team's best player to get a stop. The hope is maybe that's DeAndre Hunter eventually. Um, but that's probably the thing that right now this team is lacking more than anything else. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And you also say, you know, what are they, do they have that other next guy? Like, I, I think they are one super, they've got a lot of wing depth, but are they one high level wing away from really making that jump? Like, just just imagine right now yeah. that you were to take a couple of these wings off this team and replace them with, say, a Jimmy Butler, right? I think that sure. that changes their tier considerably. So I think that's, the, you know, and again, that's not a huge criticism. I think they're very, very well-rounded and you can't look and say, oh, they've got yeah. major weaknesses. They, they're just, I think they're just missing one top level piece. Yep. Yeah. And I, and I think that's, that's, that is really, really fair uh, with that. All right. So we've gone through that. Um, Good off season, bad off season or meh off season for you. I, I think it was good. I think it was good uh, based on, you know, yeah. everything that we've said so far, this was a good off season for the Hawks. Yeah, I'm with you. It's it's one where you you hit it earlier in the show. They didn't screw it up, and mm-hmm. that's that that is that's just as important as doing things great. Um, they're they're back to being a pretty good team. Looks like they still have upside because they've got a lot of young guys that are still growing into their roles and figuring out what they are. So so for me, retaining guys and uh, keeping paths for players uh, open, I, I think definitely a good off season there. What's your biggest question about this team going into the season? Can they become a top tier team? Can they break into that Bucks Nets stranglehold on what looks like the, a big tier break after them? Can they make that leap this season? They already made a great leap last season, getting into the, the playoffs, advancing deep into the playoffs, all of that. That was great. Can they now cement themselves as can to where we start talking about the East, not as a top two, but as a top three now with the with the hawks being part of it yeah and that's kind of where i'm at and i'm going to add just a little bit of a more of a thought for how mm-hmm. maybe they get there can they defend enough yeah. to get there using basketball references version of defensive rating they were uh, 21st in the league that that's now they were eighth in offense so they clearly more than made up for it but if you can still maintain being somewhere in the top 10 and then maybe what if they could climb to 15 
not a not a huge ask, but you know, just enough that you're in the middle of the pack. I think that's the kind mm-hmm. of thing they need to do to to move up. Um, so that leads us into their their high end and low end um, range of finish. For me, their high end is I could see if if in the in, in, let, let, let's add a little color to this too. Yeah, this is not a um if everything goes right or if everything goes wrong, because that's, that's silly, right? If everything goes right, this team could win the finals. If everything goes wrong, they could fall apart and be terrible. Yeah. These are realistic, you know, where we think they could get to. I would say they could be the second best team in the East in the regular season. Um, if the Nets or the Bucks don't push overly hard, maybe the Hawks could jump uh, up the standings there. And then I'll say on the, but I still think they're short of the finals. Maybe another trip to the conference finals could be on tap if if you know things go well in the postseason for them. And then on the low end, sixth in the East, I can't see them being worse than than sixth. I I don't see them dropping into the play in. You you like you read it right off my screen or something here. <laughs> that is that <laughs> was wish. that was exactly my my analysis as well. Was they could wind up finishing second or so in the regular season because one of the Nets or the Bucs just don't push that hard during the regular season. Uh, but then come playoff time, I see them topping out at Eastern Conference Finals once again. Uh, and then the low end probably be about the sixth seed if you know Philly pulls things together. Maybe the Knicks have another strong season, right? That's where I could see them dropping down to like the, the sixth seed or so. So that's that's and we're we're in lockstep here, Keith. That's my analysis as well of, of <laughs> their their nice. high and low. All right, so that closes out the Hawks. You want to move to the Dallas Mavericks? Yeah, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about the Mavs and uh, well, Luca's Luca's team. Um, yeah, uh, let's dive into it. I guess we'll start things right. off with, with uh, the... players added. Yeah, players added. Moses Brown came over from the Boston Celtics in a trade that sent Josh Richardson uh, to Boston. Uh, Sterling Brown was signed using the biannual exception. Reggie Bullock got the non-taxpayer mid-level exception uh, from Dallas. And then they added Ja'Cory McLaughlin and Eugene Omarui to their two-way uh, contracts players lost uh th- this one was uh even out and and even in uh they lost tyler bay and nate hinton where they're two-way players they're they're both off uh two other teams nicola melli returned back home uh to italy to play jj reddick as we've talked about on the show is still a free agent um and he is sounding like he's gonna stay will not be with dallas we nope. know that um nor will it be with new orleans uh, he won't we, be with anybody say that with all confidence yeah it won't be with anybody for a while and then then We'll see uh, what J.J. Redick wants to do. And then Josh Richardson, as we said, was traded uh, to the Celtics. And then uh, they re-signed Tim Hardaway Jr., got a four-year contract um, out, of, out of the Mavs after he played really, really well in Dallas. That's uh, kind of almost become the Tim Hardaway Jr. trade mm-hmm. instead of the Chris Tapps Porzingis trade. And then Boban Majarnovic. Uh, re-signed as well so that so the big man they've got a lot of bigs on this team uh Boban Porzingis Powell Kleba uh Willie Colley Stein so a lot, a lot of big guys um there in Dallas and then their big stuff that happened was in their front office and coaching staff uh Nico Harrison comes in and replaces mm-hmm. uh Donnie Nelson as the general manager uh there and then Jason Kidd uh, formerly from your team as an assistant, comes in, getting another shot at a head coaching job, comes in as the head coach. Uh, also brought uh, another one of your former Jerry buddies. Dudley, Duds. He was my buddy first because he was at BC, so I'm going <laughs> to claim him first. Um, but yeah, mutual friend, Jared Dudley. Assistant Duffy. coach. Yeah, that they were your mutual friend. Uh, and then Luka Doncic uh, signed his uh, his extension. Now, his is a little different than Trey Young's because he has already met the qualifiers for the uh, 30% max. So he will 100% be at whatever 30% of the salary cap is uh, starting next year. Right now, that projects to be five years, $207 million uh, for Luka um, on that extension. So there we are with Dallas. Um, I think the... Guys they brought in are better than the guys they lost, uh, especially for what this team needs. And I think they got Hardaway re-signed to a nice contract. They could have gone the cap space route and got involved in a whole mm-hmm. bunch of guys, but it looks like they read the market right on that and said, nah, let, let's try to retain some guys. So not a lot of changes, but I think the ones they made are good ones. I agree. I think they are good ones. Um, I, and I think, you know, obviously being today, being Hawks and Mavs Day, I think this is the rare trade where – looking back both teams would do this trade again 
right? Like, yeah. I think the Hawks are happy with the way things are turn, turned out. I think the Mavs are happy with the way things turn out. Obviously, Luca getting that big contract extension is pretty pleased with that. But uh, but you're right. Look, the, the Mavs, they didn't do a ton this offseason. I think we can argue. Are the, is this team actually better this season or not? I think the addition of Reggie Bullock, I mean, look, anytime that you can add shooting around a star player like Luca. That's yep. usually a good thing. I know they were definitely regretting that Seth Curry trade, although I thought it was a valiant effort getting Josh Richardson. It just didn't work out for them. But you get a, in a shooter in Reggie Bullock that I think can help uh, alleviate that somewhat. Otherwise, they just kind of brought back a lot of the, the same guys, brought back Boban, and uh, they'll be off and running again. I think in order, and we're going to get into what their you know overall finish can be and everything, but this is a team that is really, as much as we talk about the Hawks banking on organic growth, the Mavs are really banking on organic growth. Like they are going to be relying on, they could very well be better next season, but it's going to be because Luca is simply getting that much better as he gets older, which is crazy to think because he's already an MVP candidate. Yeah, it needs to be, Luca needs to be kind of a guy you write in your top three yeah. uh, every year for where they want to go. Because let's face it, let's just call it what it is. He's not an addition, but Porzingis hasn't been what they hoped for. They they hoped for him to be uh the running mate to luca that was going to score 20 to 25 points per game get 10 rebounds block some shots and that the two of them would become this unstoppable duo and as much as luca has proven that's where he's at porzingis just hasn't gotten there he hasn't stayed healthy and then when he's been healthy enough to play he hasn't been that good so now we're hearing all the things of you know he's doing the right things and he's ready for a big season mm -hmm. and all these things put me in the camp of i'll believe it when i see it at this point, because it's just, I feel like we're on year three in a row of, you know, Porzingis is going to be great, you know, just, just wait. And, you know, and, and I want to believe, I, I do, I want to believe he's going to be good, but just, I'm not there right now. You know what else is happening right now, too? Ben Simmons is shooting threes in pickup games. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so that's, that's obviously something that's going to okay. happen. That's the year. <laughs> it feels like we're on year 50 of that happening. I did want to mention yeah, Porzingis right. real quick. You know, we, we're going to get into the cap stuff. Porzingis, 31.6 million next season, season after that, 33.8. And then you've got a player option for 30, 36 million. Uh, do you feel like he's a negative value contract at this point? Because we talked yesterday a little bit about how we overreact to things. And Porzingis didn't have a great season last year, but I think there's a little bit of recency bias at play where people are overreacting to what we saw in a bad matchup for him in the playoffs and forgetting that he put up 20 and nine during the regular season. Like he wasn't mm -hmm. the star we were hoping he would be, but I don't think he was terrible either. So where are you at on his contract? Do you think he's a, he's a negative value? Like would the Mavs have to give up stuff in order to move him? No, I don't think they'd have to give up stuff i think the problem is right he only played 43 games last yeah. year now 43 out of 72 but even even still even if he had played if it was you know an 82 game year and he gave him the other 10 games that's still only 53 games so that's not very good uh 47 from the field 37 from three nine rebounds as you said 1.3 blocks 20 points those numbers all still have value. He's only 25, right? Mm -hmm. I think if I remember correctly, he's going to be 26 maybe this year. He's already 26. So he, he just, just turned 26, turned 26 uh, beginning of August. Um, yeah. So, so it's 101 million owed over the next three years. That's not great, but no, I don't think that's a full negative value contract or you don't think they're having to give up picks to get off him or anything because he can still play it's just all really kind of about health so i think when porzingis is healthy and plays you've got a pretty good player but it's also not at a point where if you were putting him in a trade you're not getting back he's not going to be the centerpiece to deliver you anything amazing either you're probably getting back some somebody else's questionable money for whatever reason it is in a swap so yeah that, that's a that's a good question i just I don't know. We'll we'll see you know where that one goes. One note I wanted to make too on Tim Hardaway Jr.'s contract. Four years, 75 million, but Dallas really smart structured this as a declining deal. So it starts at 21.3 this year, 19.6, 17.9, and then finishes up at 16.2. So uh really, really good work by the Mavs to to structure that. So as Lucas deal goes up. Uh, maybe you're in a position where Porzingis needs a new contract and has earned it. Uh, Hardaway's number is coming down. And I think even by the end of that, when he'll be in year, uh, 
can you, can you believe this is going to be year nine for him already? That's insane. Um, so that yeah, when he's right. in year 12, 16.2 million, that should still be fine for him. And I think that's an important resigning for them because Hardaway Jr., as he knows how to play with Luca. Mm-hmm. Um, I say this a lot. They have almost that quarterback wide receiver chemistry where Luca throws a pass, knowing Hardaway's going to be there yeah. for him. Um, so yeah, so I think think that is a uh, you know that that's a good one. They don't. Porzingis is maybe the most questionable contract on the books because even Dwight Powell, the eleven million this year, next year, yeah, whatever, mm-hmm. not the end of the world. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's going to be interesting to see you know where where they they go uh cap wise that they they're out of everything they use their mle yeah. they use the bae um they they think they do actually hold on let me let me double check this to make sure um yeah they do have a, a pretty good size trade exception from josh richardson but 10.8 million the problem is um they are hard capped because they use the full taxpayer and the bae mm-hmm. but they're pretty far under right now so yeah. that that could be a tool that they could use in season now that's a nice chunk to go at a player so all right so let's get into a projected starters yeah. uh for this team what do you got uh i i think that you're gonna have i mean the question really is the the center position here for them i i think you know porzingis i think he still starts tim hardaway jr of course I think you're also going to go, of course, well, Luca, I guess we got to, we got to make sure we add him in there. Right. Um, yeah. He might start. Yeah. I think he probably I mean, does. new coach, right. It, new coach is always coming and say, you got to earn your that's, place. That's right. So maybe like, not. Uh, <laughs> like urban Meyer with Trevor Lawrence, right? No, Gardner Minshew right. really might. <laughs> yeah. He really might be our starting quarterback. Come on. Uh, <laughs> all the way to getting traded. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's got to earn that. Yeah. But uh, but no, I, I do think you're going to have those guys in there. I think that uh, that Reggie Bullock makes sense in that starting lineup as well, provides a little bit of shooting. And then for me, I'm probably leaning towards a Dwight Powell. I like his chemistry with, with Luca starting at your, at your center position there. I like that. I would love to be able to just say unleash the Boban and just, and just put him in there for as many minutes as you can get him for. But, <laughs> but, uh, but no, I think it's going to be Dwight Powell. Yeah. So we're close, um, which is good. We differ for, for the first time mm-hmm. in this episode. Um, I think Dorian Finney Smith hangs on to his starting spot okay. just cause I think he, he's the best defender of that group, uh, by a pretty good margin. So I, I'll go with Luca Hardaway, uh, Finney Smith, Porzingis and Powell. Um, Fair. there, and I think Reggie Bullock plays like the six man role coming off the bench, but plays a ton. Um, there, good versatility in that group, good versatility coming off the bench. And so, as we transition to their rotation players, I think, as I said, Bullock probably the six man for all purposes here. Uh, Jalen Brunson will play quite a bit, yes. Maxi Kleba. Um, I think they got Sterling Brown with the idea of him playing a good amount as a bigger um wing. Um, for for them and then it's kind of the grab bag of willie collie stein boban moses brown will, mm-hmm. two will probably play pretty regularly because they they just don't like porzingis at the five um you know and maybe that changes with right. jason kidd now in the fold that's going to be something we're going to have to keep keep an eye on because that could open up all sorts of fun lineup possibilities if they did that uh but those guys will probably play some too and then Let's see if Trey Burke can work his way back into the rotation or not. Uh, Josh Green, last year's first round pick, and not feeling so great about that one. Um, I guess as he's probably inactive when most guys are healthy. So mm-hmm. pretty good depth on this team, but it's this is going to be a team I'll be watching quite a bit early in the season to see how Jason Kidd is treating the rotation. Because Rick Carlisle would yank guys in and out of the starting lineup, guys in and out of the rotation uh, pretty regularly. Let's see how uh, how Kidd treats that moving forward. Yeah, I mean, Kidd's going to have to change some stuff, right? If he just keeps sure. things the same way as Rick Carlisle, then what can he point to and say, look, I did that. This is what you brought me in for, right? So there's going to be changes in terms of the rotation. I am really curious to see how Porzingis gets used. Do we see him more yeah. floating on the perimeter? Do we see him a little bit more in the post? What are we looking at for him defensively? I think that's going to be really key for the Mavs. And ultimately, maybe key for Porzingis' trade value if they make the decision that, look, this it's just not going to work. The Luke and Porzingis pairing, you need Porzingis' trade value to be as high as it can get. And that might mean showcasing him in some different ways. Now, I'm not saying that's what the, the goal is going to be. I think that they're going to try to use him and utilize him uh, in different ways than what we saw previously and the ways to uh, maximize his value. But it's possible 
that we see him moved if the Mavs are going to get better. Because that, and I don't want to spoil it, but that's one of my big questions about this team is how do they get to the next level? Yeah, no, in the, well, we'll get there in just a second, yep. so let's do strengths and weaknesses. I'll go first on the strengths this time. Luca, obviously, yep. <laughs> that's an <laughs> yeah. easy one. Uh, you know, one of the best players in the league, so it's always good to have him. Uh, now he's signed to that long-term contract. There was that little bit of buzz. Is he not really happy mm-hmm. there? You know, could he be the first guy to do the qualifying offer and, and go? I wrote a long piece for uh, Spot Track using Luca as the example there of why that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> Just the staggering amount of money he would have to turn down. Um, but yeah, he's locked in there now. Now we know that's only as good as the year that they can't trade him for. Um, but beyond that. Let's see where it goes. You know, um, you know, with that, we know, guys, that means not much, right? If things aren't getting better here within the next couple of years, you know, he'll chirp and then uh, he'll probably be off elsewhere. Um, but then my other thing is I just think they have pretty good versatility yeah. um, on this team. I think you've got guys who can – a lot of guys who can play two. Some, some can even play maybe three positions on this team. They could go really big because you can slide Luca off the ball if you wanted to and play with a smaller point guard out there. Um, or you can play him on the ball and go, uh, you know, really supersized. Um, you can do a lot of different – different things you know with, with this team so i th- think that's a uh, their strength so i think uh, luca and then their versatility yeah i agree i'm looking at their roster and thinking man i could see a scenario where late in games you've got who we didn't even mention this as a potential starter but maxi kleba could be somebody that they could look at the mm-hmm. starting lineup but if you just yeah. want to space the hell out of the floor you run a lineup with luca tim hardaway jr reggie bullock porzingis and maxi kleba and you've got some decent size there with Porzingis and Kleba, and you still have shooting at all five positions. I think that's really yep. intriguing to me, especially late in games if they're trailing. Put that group out there. I think it would be a lot of fun. Yeah, and that's that's the benefit of Luca, right? Because he's he's as close to what we have in the league as a six foot seven point mm-hmm. guard right now that isn't LeBron, right? It, it's they're they're the two big point guards right now in the league as far as offensively. Now, neither one of them is a point guard defensively because neither one of them spends any time guarding the other team's yeah. point guard. So, you know, and that's, again, that's why it was important to resign Hardaway because Hardaway does pick up that matchup a lot for Luca, especially if it's a more offensive minded point guard uh, there. So yeah, I, I think that that's it. Uh, biggest weakness for me, defense still, it, it is funny we're going to, you know, maybe we're beating this into the ground a little bit, but how Hawks like this team is like just these two teams feel so connected, but Dallas was ninth in offense, 21st in defense last year. Hawks were eighth and 20th. So they're like right there, uh, you know, with, with those guys. And it maybe speaks to a little bit of, or maybe both sides have gone a little more offense than you needed to when you already have two of the premier offensive talents and Trey and Luca on the team. So yeah, get it. I, 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 this team's got to improve defensively if they're going to get better. I think their, their biggest weakness, and I agree with you on the defensive side of things, but aside from Luca, who's creating offense on this team? Like they, yeah. they, they are, no, good, good they are very reliant on Luca to, to do everything for them. And that's, you know what, that's fine. He's young right now. He can probably yeah. bear that burden. You could say, okay, Jalen Brunson maybe can get in and do some things, but they are really needing a secondary creator. They really need needed Porzingis to pop and become a star in order to draw defenses and, and just kind of give that, that little extra boost that you need in order to take some of the pressure off of Luca. But this team is extremely reliant on Luca to do Big everything time. and i think that could come back to hurt them that is a great point because that's what josh richardson was supposed to be was that yep. guy who could take you know four or five dribbles and make something happen either for himself or others and it never really developed because when luca has the ball so much you're you've got to you've got to really excel to either force it out of his hands or or get it somewhere else it's starting to feel a little bit like james hardenish in Houston for years we're like who else is going to mm-hmm. do something and then it was finally Chris Paul uh and then Russell Westbrook and those those worked okay i mean Chris Paul worked great yeah. i think for a couple of seasons they, they you know arguably should have made a finals had they stayed healthy um so yeah so that that's what it is starting to feel a little bit like is it's Luke and you know a lot of other guys but it takes the right kind of guy to say all right, yeah, fine. 80% of the time I'm cool being a 
stand up uh, spot up shooter, stand still spot up shooter. But all right, now you need me to do something. All right, get me the ball and I'll do something right. like that. That gets a little a little more tricky. So no, that's a good call um, on that one. The, the offensive creation aside from Luca, that's always going to be something. And then non Luca minutes. What happens, you know, when yeah. he sits for his, you know, fifteen minutes a night or whatever it'll be? Um, good, bad, or indifferent off season for you? You know, so we came into this saying the Hawks and the Mavs they kind of both did the same thing in terms of mostly running it back with their own guys, but I don't feel nearly as good about the Mavs running it back as I do about the Hawks. I feel like the Hawks still have plenty of upside. There's still going to be organic growth there, whereas the Mavs, I felt like the Mavs needed to do some stuff. And I can't look at this roster and say, oh, just via organic growth, they're just naturally going to be better than they were last season. I can look and see the young guys the Hawks have and say, well, Kevin Herter is going to get better, right? DeAndre Hunter, if he's healthy, he's going to get better, right? Like all these players that are going to improve, Luka might get better for the Mavs, but who else is? And I don't really have that player I could point to. So I'm going to say between indifferent and bad, I felt like they needed to do something they're going to be still good this season. I guess I guess I'll lean more towards indifferent, right? I can't say it's good, but it, it's not terrible either. Yeah, it's it's and that's basically where I'm at too because I don't think it was bad cuz they didn't sign any really no, awful contracts right. or do something really dumb. Um they didn't, you know, go all in and trade for a guy who's only going to be there for a year or whatever. It just felt like this off season might have been bigger. Mm-hmm. I guess, and I guess we we spent a year looking at wow, Dallas is going to have thirty five million dollars in cap space, and they're going to be players for all these guys. And clearly, they were setting up to make a run at Giannis, right. and then Giannis came off the board with his extension. And then uh, I think they read it right and said, "All right, we're not getting involved in that Kyle Lowry stuff because it's going to cost us a whole bunch of guys, and then we're going to have Kyle Lowry, Luca, and not much mm-hmm. else on um, there." So, but yeah, I. I I guess I'm in the same spot where I'm more like kind of meh, let's see um, where that goes. So are you, you kind of alluded to it a yeah. couple minutes ago, but what's your biggest question for this team? How do they get better? How does this team get better? Yeah. Look at their cap situation. It's not like they're going to have money to spend for the next couple of years. And I'm looking at this roster. I don't see a bunch of trade assets here. Now, if Porzingis suddenly turns it around and is killing it, maybe by the trade deadline that's changed and they've got something in him that they can ship out. Uh, maybe there's some other pieces, you know, maybe a team finds themselves in need of a bid and big and they can move. You know, Dwight Powell's got a very movable deal. Maxi Kleba does as well. But sure. do you really want to move those guys and then rely on, say, Willie Cully Stein to eat up those minutes in the middle? I just don't see an obvious path for them. Now, you mentioned that trade exception they've got. That might be their best shot at really getting better. And even then, it's not a huge... I mean, it's a big trade exception, but it's not like you're yeah, going to go 10. absorb... Million. You're not going to absorb a $20 million deal or anything like that. No. So that's my big question here is how do they get better? How do they avoid getting stuck to the point where two seasons from now, Luke is frustrated and then the pressure is really on? Yeah, so in... in um... Um, I'm going to steal something kind of that you said before okay. is who becomes that second guy yeah. and can it be Chris Stapps Porzingis? Can Porzingis break through and be an all-star level player this year instead of someone who you're like, yeah, it's kind of good, but those stats look good, but they just never feel great. Um, you know, can he get rid of the nights where he shoots 10 of 10 for 12 for 30 points. And then the next night he is four for 20 for 10 points. And it, it looks good in the aggregate when you look at it and you're like, wow, you know, this was pretty good shooting around 50% and averaging 20 points per night. But when you really look at it together, it's like, oh yeah, it's, it's very inconsistent. It's all over the place. Can he be that guy? Cause as it stands right now, he has to be, if this team is going to get to be, be uh, better than what they are. So that's a, a pretty good segue into their high end and low end uh, finishes. I'll let you go first on this one if you're prepared to. Yeah, I'm, and I'm going back and forth on this team. Like, I don't think they're they're not, they're definitely not a tier one team in the West. And I'm gonna put the Lakers, the Jazz, the Suns right now in tier one in the Western Conference. I think the Nuggets, depending on what happens with Jamal Murray, they could be into that mix as well. So I don't think they can be in that top. Four, I think their ceiling, and you can argue Golden State should be in that mix too. I can't put them ahead of Golden State either. 
their ceiling to me then has got to be it's got to be six <laughs> like as the more i keep thinking about this and, and the west is tough the west is tough to project but the more i keep thinking about this i can't put them ahead of the warriors i can't put them ahead of so many of these teams and the clippers i think are gonna be better than people think so i've got their ceiling right now at sixth in the west which means we're probably talking about best case we're looking at a second round out in the playoffs for for the mavs uh it's possible luca is just so good that they're able to to do better than that i guess but i don't really see that happening the low side uh is they're in the playing tournament and that's that's what i see as their their range of outcomes here yeah i'm I'm a little higher on the high side. Okay. I could see maybe if Luca takes that step and is all the way full 82 games, we're talking about him as, you know, one or two in the MVP sure. race. And Porzingis is better in there. Just the roster really fits well. And Jason Kidd gets him there. That's, I could see them maybe fourth. Okay. But that's, but even saying like all those things go well and get you to fourth. That probably more realistically, yeah, you're in the five six range mm -hmm. of, on the high end. So, so I'll, I'll say fourth, but I don't feel great about it. On the low end, I could see them being tenth in the playing tournament. Yeah. Like I really could see them being. It's Luke has to do too much, and all the teams we think could be better. So the Lakers, the Jazz, the Suns, the Nuggets, the uh, Warriors are all significantly better in their fighting with the memphis portland clippers uh range in there and, and then we know i mean at the bottom of the west we, we talked this just the other day the rockets and thunder look like kind of the only easy games on the schedule yeah. in the west right now because even minnesota i think is going to be better and they played a lot better under chris finch um well, i know we'll talk about that in their preview when we get to it but yeah, and then you still have Memphis is in there. San Antonio is still going to be trying to win. I think that's the hard part for Dallas mm -hmm. is there's not – you're not looking at any of those teams and saying, oh, yeah, Dallas is way better than those teams. It just doesn't feel like that to me. Those feel – yeah, Dallas should win, but I'm not going to be shocked if they – you know, lose a game in San Antonio. Like, okay, you know, it happened. I feel like in totality – I've come off very negative about the, about the Mavs. And, <laughs> and I guess I want to throw it. I I'm excited to watch this team play. Like they are going to be yeah. on my league past list of teams that I need to make sure that I check out. I want to see what Luca can do with his squad. I guess I'm just a little underwhelmed overall with what this team has, uh, has accomplished this off season. But uh, you know, yep. it's always possible that Luca is just that good that he, uh, he drags them forward. It just feels like he has to be. Yeah. And it feels like this is now we're into, let's call it what it is. This is going to be year three of Luca has to be awesome because he got him into the playoffs in the bubble mm -hmm. and then got him into the playoffs last year. And in between that, the Olympics where he carried that Slovenia team, you know, as far as he really kind of possibly could, that's concerning for me yeah. is that we're putting an awful lot on this dude and saying, Hey man, you, you, you gotta be that guy. Now, if he is great, then he's going to be deserving of every bit of MVP consideration yeah. he gets. Even if the team is fourth, fifth, sixth in the West, that's what because I worry about. he could be that good. Yeah. And that, that's, that's in the minds of a lot of voters that eliminates a guy from MVP consideration. Oh, and that's, yeah, I don't, I don't like Tough. that. I don't, I don't like no. that. That, I don't know that yeah. aspect of the voting. In some, I always think of it in some ways. People always say, well, how valuable was it to be fourth in your own conference? Pretty damn valuable because without them, this team's not even a playoff right, team. Right, exactly. Right? They're, they're, they're nowhere even close to that. So, yeah, it's it's they're they're always one of my favorite teams to watch because I love watching Luka play. He's much like Trey Young on the Hawks mm -hmm. and a handful of other guys in the league. You just you go into the night sitting down to watch that game feeling – well, I might see something pretty cool tonight mm -hmm. that, you know, Luca might drop a 45 point triple double tonight with, you know, a game winner from 45 feet, you know, and you, you just start to feel like, man, this is, this is it. So yeah, I'm very, uh, very interested to see what this team becomes this year. And then how does that impact the decision-making? And that's without even getting into the whole Jason Kidd of it all, right. you know, does, you know, 
does he finally figure this out? Because he wasn't great in his first two stops as a head coach, and there were some issues. So, yeah, it's going to be very, very interesting to watch how this team all comes together over the next couple of years. All right. Well, let's um, – why don't we spin that wheel, Keith, and let's find out who we're going to talk let's about in, our, in our, next, our next show. All right, guys. So just as a reminder, we do that. I promise, promise, promise. Other than we're not going to do the Celtics and the Lakers in the same show. Mm -hmm. That's our only qualifier. Um, this is completely random. It's going to give us one East team and one West team. Let's see who they are. All right. In the East, the Charlotte Hornets. I like it. And in the West, the Memphis Grizzlies. Sweet. Okay. Yeah. I can do that. That's fun. I dig it. Two up and coming teams. Yep. So, Yeah. All right, there we are, ja, Charlotte and Memphis. Ja and LaMelo. Let's let's do it. Yeah, I like it. All right, so that will be – now, obviously, right. if, there, if there's breaking news or a bunch of news stories, we may put one of those episodes sandwiched in between here, but we are still progressing through our preview review series as well. So just know that's going to be coming. Memphis – and Charlotte, that will be the next preview review show that you see. Don't forget, subscribe right here to the NBA Front Office YouTube channel. If you're listening to the podcast version, make sure you follow us over on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever it is that you listen to podcasts, and leave us a review as well. We love reading those. Make sure you like this video, and I think that about wraps things up for today. Go go tell mom, dad, grandma, aunt, uncle, subscribe too. That's right. We, we want to cross that 10K barrier. That's a, a pretty cool thing. And we appreciate all of you gotten us there that far. And if you haven't subscribed, hey, you subscribe too. We promise we're only going to give you good content uh, going forward. That's right. That's right. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching or listening. Stay safe and see you.